Hello and welcome to one of many talks with the artist from the show titled That Which Was Will Come Again at the Gallery of the Atlantic Wharf. I'm Kimberly Barnes, uh, man Programs Manager of the Fort Point Arts Community. Here at FPAC, we strive to bring cultural vibrancy to Boston, Massachusetts, and most importantly, support the artists in the New England area. I'm here with Carol, excuse me, I'm here with Carol Otvern from The Circle Art, a group of four visual artists who began meeting together early um, spring of 2020. These artists have developed a supportive community to inspire and encourage each other's art, artist, uh, artistic vision. Sorry, I'm having uh, tongue-tied moments. Um, Carolyn Letvin, who is a resident of Plainville, Massachusetts, has exhibited in the New England area since 1990. She's an accomplished landscape and interior painter who also creates animal imagery. Having won many awards the year, she began teaching her plein air printmaking process in Kyoto, uh, sorry, Kyotaku fish printing. Her work here, her work can be seen at Galatea Fine Arts in Boston, Massachusetts, Gallery Twist in Lexington, Massachusetts, Hudson Art and Framing in Hudson, Massachusetts, and Gallery Wright in Wilmington, Vermont. Uh, thank you, Carolyn, again for joining me. How are you doing today? Good, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so you can talk a little bit about um, your practice as an artist and like your motivations. We can kind of get going from there. Um, I started painting in 1973. So I've been at it for a while. I'm primarily an oil painter. I like the smell and the mess. That's what gets my juices going. And as soon as I smell the medium and the paint, um, my head goes into a zone. And it has from the moment I started painting. Um, it, it was, it's all, it, it was all very magical. I had a eureka moment when I learned to paint. I learned, I was taught by Ted Fitzke. He was part of the Pennsylvania Realist School. I grew up in Pennsylvania. And um, I took a summer intensive with him and he taught the Flemish old master sort of process, which is paint the darks, lay in the local color mid values and hit it with the lights and boom, you have a three-dimensional realistic rendition. And, and it can go from really minimal shapes and values, like three values, dark, middle value, light, to all the gradations in between. But when the realism came off the end of my brush, I was, I was just enthralled and I was immediately addicted. And I've been doing it ever since. And it was that eureka moment because that's how I learn. I'm kind of a late bloomer and a slow learner and I can go along for a long time not getting it and then boom, oh, I understand now. So um, his particular method was called the marriage technique. And if you Google that, you get all kinds of information. But um, with that beginning, we stretched linen we um, prepared it with rabbit skin glue and white lead back in the day when it wasn't, it wasn't illegal mm -hmm. lead and ground our own paints with the black oil that we made. And then we made our own Flemish medium, which was, that was a little magic in itself because you had to put two things together in a baby jar, go boop, boop. And that was the mix and you'd put it on the windowsill and you may or may not get a really good medium out of that. It was really a, an iffy process, mm -hmm. but wow, it was, so I really respect archival processes because of that, that whole uh, learning experience. And it was on a private level. Mm -hmm. um, no teacher that I've ever had since then has ever given me that that kind of experience of understanding and um, evolving and changing. I still use all that. That's still the underpinning to all my work. Mm -hmm. Even with the sheep that are showing at the Atlantic Wharf show. Yeah, oh, that's really amazing. And it sounds like there's this tactility with art that you really enjoy and appreciate. Uh, Am I getting that right or is it kind of- Yes, like no, you're absolutely right. Um, my mom was really artistic. In fact, she was a way better artist than I ever can be. She was very artistic. 
And we did art and crafts my whole life. So I got a lot of affirmation about making stuff. Amazing. And um, I believe I also, so as far as that goes, I feel like I inherited that trait. And also on my dad's side, he also had artistic, um, he had artistic uh, leanings as a child, mm -hmm. um, which of course as a man, he was back then in the, um, when they, he was young and um, growing up in Philadelphia in a poor family, it, it wasn't really something that could be indulged. And, but he became an engineer, which is also visual. Mm -hmm. And he built things, he built boilers and heaters and air conditioners, and he was an inventor and he has some patents. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like I've got, I've got these two people on my shoulder who have given me these talents through my genes and, and it's my job to do the best I can with it. Mm -hmm. They were both incredible people in their own right. And um, uh, my mom had us going all the time with making stuff. So I do love the tactile, I love craft. Mm -hmm. um, that takes, that leads me into that golden fleece series because that has the foil leaf in it, which satisfies my craft soul. I love doing it. And I'd never done it until that particular project came along. Oh yeah. Um, what brought you to using that material? Um, I went to Andy Warhol's museum in Pittsburgh and I had been painting the sheep for a number of years at that point. And I walked into that museum and saw his bubblegum color pieces with the gold foil outlines of people, about, right? Yeah. Then he had the ink, black ink drawings on yeah. and boom, this whole golden fleece series came full formed into my head. And that was the moment where I said, oh, that's my next series. Mm -hmm. And that's what it became. It, it became the next series. And so I looked into this metal leaf and of course I use craft level metal leaf, not 24 karat gold, because um, I can't command the prices that real gold um, demands, but hopefully someday, um, and maybe with the help of four points, I'll get there. <laughs> with, that, with, real gold. <laughs> with becoming, the it girl in the art world. <laughs> See, I have big goals. <laughs> a, a real gold Kickstarter. <laughs> That's right. I need to be kickstarted for real gold, which I would love to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's what started that Golden Fleece series. And I, I do love to do it because of that. Mm -hmm. um, man, that's so amazing. And, and I would love to talk about your, um, Sheep number seven, the oil monotype. And I've seen you do monotype before. So just like that whole process is just very engaging. I want to look, learn a little bit more about that. That came to me, that process came from my teacher here in this area who I was with um, from the late 80s into the 2000s. So I was with Gemma Phillips out of Brookline for more than 20 years. And she had a press and she believed in painters being printmakers. And I did that piece with her press. It's big. It's the biggest monotype I've ever done. And it, it's painterly, it's minimal. It's, it was one of those magical pieces that, you know, you just, it, those pieces are what get you through to the next, you know, you just keep hoping that that experience of, oh yeah, I nailed it. Even with all the, you know, the junk in between and then you nail something again and it, it just keeps you going. That feeling of success within yourself that you achieve something of your own. But it really is just doing a painting on plexiglass and either using a press or rubbing it by hand in some way to get a monotype. And I use damp paper with oil paint. I do not use ink. I've never used ink 
for my monotypes. And that's really cool um, to me. Most people use ink, even painters use ink, but I don't. And that's what Gemma um, taught us and teaches. So um, her, her influence there is, is incredibly great. And I've taken that into another body of work um, that is sort of my invention, which is plein air monotyping, which is taking our oil paints out in the field and using a little palm press, a GC palm press that I have made, I make them and sell them. I have them made and I sell them. Um, and I demo and teach that process because I think plein air printmaking is a really nifty concept. See, I'm an observational artist. I don't work out of my head. I don't invent imagery. I see things that I make into art. So I believe, even though I've tried to be an abstract artist, I believe I will be a realist artist my whole life because that's what gets me going between the smell of the oil paint mm -hmm. and the 3D realism that comes off the end of my brush like magic. Mm -hmm. um, boy, that's my charge and that's what, that's my little addiction. <laughs> that's, uh, that sounds so exciting. And it, it almost sounds like you're an impressionist. Is that the type of work you like or the type of art movement that you like? I've gone through liking different movements. When I first learned to paint with that Flemish old master style, Rembrandt was my hero. All that brown and the earth colors. And when I was grinding my own paints, those are the colors that you had accessible to you. It wasn't, we didn't tube it, you know? We didn't get paint out of the tube. So we had no new colors. Um, and I love that. And then of course, as a young person, I discovered the Impressionists and went bonkers for them mm -hmm. and still love any Impressionist show that the MFA can put on, I'm there <laughs> um, because the color is magnificent. Yeah. But I really, I am now stuck in the 20s, late 1800s and the 20s, 30s and 40s with um, Bonard who like jumped out of the Impressionists with the Nobbies and the Fauvists and that wacky doodle color that they apply to everything. Mm -hmm. And I love looking at green skin and pink trees and orange skies and, you know, a, a, any, even though I don't paint that way because I, the sheep do go off into an impressionist look, mm -hmm. um, but it's, I don't think of it as impressionist. And then my other body of work, one of my bodies of work, the interiors that I paint, they're definitely not, in fact, that's a more minimal palette than anything. Mm -hmm. I like doing those in grays and browns and hitting with little bits of color. They rarely go um, full, full palette bright colors. Um, and then the golden fleece, of course, have gone through a whole evolution of Andy Warhol bubblegum colors to um, pale neutral sort of almost yellow, almost pink, almost green. So they're pastel. And then even into the grays that my teacher Gemma suggested that these would be very elegant, the gold on gray. So I have this series of gray going on. Um, to see that. Hey, I wish I could be a knobby, <laughs> but I'm not. I can only be what I can be. Yeah. <laughs> um. But those, that, those are the books and the imagery I love to look at. The uh, the Bloomfield group in England, oh my gosh, that whole group just, that's a wow. Mm -hmm. um, what, or what, can you talk more about the Bloomfield group? Actually, I'm not familiar with that. Oh, they were, um, they were a group of writers and painters, and I think there was even some theater, I'm not really sure, but they were very visual, and they all started to 
get together and actually live together. Virginia Woolf was part of that group. Cool. And um, write that down. Yeah, the painters that come out of that are amazing. Yeah. Um, they even decorated their their house. Um, they started into craft in that the mantelpieces in the house they lived in. They they decorated them, they invented them and created them. And so everything in their space became an artistic expression. Mm -hmm. um, they became a culture in a way in their own, I think there were like 20 of them that over time came and went. And other than Virginia Woolf, who's a writer, I'm kind of blanking on the other artists, but check it out yeah. because they're an amazing movement out of England. And England, we don't really talk about too many English artists, um, but England has an incredible history of amazing artists that you never really heard of. Um, it, when you take art history, there's only so much time in school that anything can be devoted to anything. Yeah, And so it, becomes a lifelong search to me to find, to come across artists that I love. Um, used bookstores are usually my starting point. Uh -huh. But England has this in, an incredible history of artists that, well, they're just, you know, inspiring. Yeah, and it kind of sounds like the Bloomfield group sort of inspired your, your interior paintings. Or is it just sort of like this is something that you wanted to try? Actually, I think I was doing interior paintings before I found the Bloomfield group. So it was probably the interiors that they were doing. Some of them, they, they don't really have a um, any person in that group that is devoted to interiors. But the interiors <laughs> kind of started... Um, there's, there are a group of us who go up to Jaffrey, New Hampshire. We've been doing it for 12 years now. The COVID um, stopped it this year. Um, but we were going up there to be plein air artists and it, it became a plein air retreat. And over time it evolved. And plein air, there are a lot of really good plein air painters out there in the world. And I'm only an average one. <laughs> and I really am just an average plein air painter. And we were staying in this amazing cottage. And I realized that when I was going out for the day to pay plein air, that I really wanted to stay inside. Mm -hmm. And so one summer when we went up, I thought, why don't I just paint inside? Why should I go out and compete with all of these amazing painters who paint plein air so much better than me. I want to paint the interior of this place. And I, that's how it started. It was just a, a way for me to express myself a little differently. And I took to it. And the funny thing is, my painting teacher, Gemma, had been telling me for years that I should be doing interiors. And I, I think it was Fairfield Porter's interiors that um, sparked her to suggest that to me because of what my hand does. And you know how other people have better insights into you and your work than mm -hmm. you do, which is why it's so hard to critique your own work. Mm -hmm. That's the hardest thing in the world. Um, and that's the reason for me to be in a painting group so that you have other people looking at your stuff saying, wow, that, um, that shape over there, that shouldn't be there. That, you know, don't put that lamp there. It's really wrecking your composition or something like that. Just feedback and you can take it or leave it certainly, but um, that kind of an interaction with a painting group has been so valuable to me. And that group up in Jaffrey that We've had so many people come and go through that group. Um, and it has evolved and changed. And people now bring up, they do their own projects when they're there. And not everyone is a plein air painter. So even that evolves. Nothing stays the same. Nothing. 
um, well, it, and it, it kind of sounds like you had that innovation kind of spark, like just from like how your parents were like, they just worked with what they had or they just like found art everywhere. So you're like, no, I'm going to stay inside and find art and inspiration just from like my surroundings. I think that's, that's so amazing. Well, that what you just said made me think of, oh my gosh, if I heard it once, I heard it a million times from both my parents, be a leader, not a follower. Yeah. Whatever that meant at the time when you're a little kid and all you can do is follow because you're given lessons and, you know, you can, anyway, it, it is something that repeats in my head a lot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, parents are always there and I, I'm lucky to have had parents who keyed in on my passions and allowed me to follow them mm -hmm. because that's, that's a grand gift. Mm -hmm. That's a grand life gift because it gives you confidence in wherever and wh whenever you are wh and wherever you are in your life mm -hmm. to know that you are okay there mm -hmm. is a, a gift both my parents gave to me. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they forced it on me, you know, bam, bam, be a leader, not a follower. And other times it's just, you know, you go girl. Yeah, that's so great. And like, look where it's brought you. Like you've led such an amazing like artistic life and I'm, I'm sure they'd be proud and like would support your art like along the way. I hope so. And they had that when they were alive, they were always supportive. Um, I made my living as a graphic designer, so I took my art, my art that Ted Fitzke launched me in, got me into art school, which allowed me to have my graphic design career where I worked on my own. I, I freelanced. I only worked for three years under bosses and for companies, mm -hmm. and I didn't do that very well. So in my own little way, I am leading me and I am following me. And that's what my parents gave me, that philosophy of, of doing it on my own. And my dad was self-employed and my mom never stopped. She was always doing something. There was never a down moment. She was not a working mom, but she volunteered. And I spend a lot of my time now that I'm retired volunteering, way more time doing that than um, painting. Wow. <laughs> and luckily I paint fast so I can create bodies of work and it doesn't look like that. It looks like I've worked a lot of time on a lot of time. So. Yeah, that's great. Um, actually I have uh, two questions. So like what brought you to graphic design and then also, um, then we can kind of move back towards the show, but why do you paint sheep? Um, what brought me to graphic design, um, was, a personal tragedy. I had a knee injury in college. I was actually a phys ed major. Oh, wow. And I wrecked my knee. But um, I had a surgery based on a misdiagnosis, which at 19 wrecked my knee. So on crutches, I'm on crutches now trying to, you know, get my life going thinking I'm, how am I going to do phys ed? And my dad looked at me and this is, this is so, so dad. He said, I don't think you're going back to phys ed school. You got to find something else to do to support yourself. Mm -hmm. I'll take you down to the local college and you can look at some catalogs and pick something out that you want to do. Mm -hmm. Well, I was either going to, and I knew this, I was either going to be playing games like hitting balls or drawing pictures. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to work. I wanted nothing to do with work and work to me would be like a bank teller or <laughs> office work, typing, um, any kind of, that was before computers now. Um, so any kind of administrative work that would be called work. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to play. I wanted my life to be playing. I wanted to play games or draw pictures. So on crutches, I go down to the local college and I'm looking through catalogs just pulling them out of the, you know, the shelf, not having any direction except for 
I guess I'm going to draw pictures. And I found this thing called graphic design, which I had no idea even existed. And I read about it in a college catalog, came home and said, this is what I'm going to do. Well, how do you do that? You've got to have a portfolio. Mm -hmm. So I started taking art classes in York, where I grew up, York, Pennsylvania. And that's where I learned to draw and paint and boom, I ended up here in Boston because there were three schools here to interview with. Um, Mass College of Art, Art Institute of Boston, and the New England School of Art and Design, which was just at the time New England School of Art. Mm -hmm. And Mass Art couldn't accept me until December. And I wanted to start in September. <laughs> I've been home for a year on crutches with my mom taking care of me. The surgery made me quite sick. It really took every ounce of energy that I had to heal. And it took me a year. Wow. So Mass College of Art couldn't take me until September, uh, till December. Our, both the Art Institute of Boston and um, New England School of Art would accept me in September. And I picked New England School of Art and Design. And that's where I went to school for graphic design. And they, they gave me a great education. It was three year technical. Okay. Um, so I don't have a degree. I have four years of college, but I don't have a degree. Um, but I have that technical degree in it. And it gave me a career that okay. suited my personality because not only am I a late bloomer and a slow learner, but I'm also a willful child. And I wanna do things my way. And I did it my way. And it makes me feel good that I did it that way, my way. <laughs> and I'll, I'll resist breaking into the Frank Sinatra singing. <laughs> That's one of my favorite songs of his. <laughs> <laughs> And it should be as an artist. We all should do it our way, right? Yeah. <laughs> so then how did I start painting sheep? Well, I actually stopped painting for about 15 years. Oh, wow. And it was when I had my graphic design career and it was all consuming. As you know, um, as a working young artist, you don't really get time to do your artwork. And I yeah. really kind of put it aside. And I had gotten married and the marriage didn't last very long. And um, my therapist asked me what I had given up from what, what I had been doing before I married and what I had stopped doing. And the answer right away came out painting. And it wasn't because of marriage, it was just because of marriage and work and your life and everything you're doing, I had stopped painting. She said, I think you should pick it up again. So in 1989, I did when I divorced. And um, I went through a lot of, to get back to painting and find my own path with Gemma as a teacher, because that's who I landed with as a teacher in 1989. And the sheep didn't come until 2001. Mm -hmm. And I went, because I love animals, Gemma always said, paint what you love. When you run out of something to paint, she said, paint what you love. Well, I started painting animals because I just, I love animals. I, I would have a hundred cats if I could. I want to be the crazy cat lady of any town I live in, but I only have one. And um, I painted them for a while and I thought, oh, these things are, you know, going to go out in the world and, but they didn't, people didn't relate to them. So I started painting other animals, which made me happy. And I went to a farm in central Pennsylvania to paint cows. And there was this little herd of Jacob sheep. They're a particular breed. I'd never seen them before. They aren't the sheep that are around on farms, the white ones that we think of jumping over clouds when we count them. These were little petite spotted multiple horns, almost goat-like noses. And I was enthralled. And I 
stop painting calves, took a ton of pictures of these sheep and started making paintings. And here it is, it, this summer will be 20 years and I'm still painting them and loving them and they sell. It's the funniest thing. So um, one of the things my dad always said about life, he said, all you need in this life is a shtick. Yeah. So <laughs> sheep are my shtick. And I just enjoy doing them so much. And I don't paint them plein air. I don't paint them live. I find herds. I go and I photograph them. I get in the pasture and I take a bunch of pictures with these sheep running all around scared, which is why they're often doing this you know, <laughs> over their rear end because they're running away and then they stop and they look at you <laughs> and they are so adorable. Mm -hmm. And then I work from photographs. So basically that's my winter's in studio work. Mm -hmm. I won't go outside and when it's cold, I, you know, that's just too hard. Mm -hmm. and, and it just took off from there. Mm -hmm. So sheep are everywhere. Sheep, sheep, sheep. <laughs> all, I love it. I don't think I'll ever stop painting sheep. And there have been a lot of artists who've painted sheep and sheep are important. They're often one of the first things that we as babies see. It's nursery rhyme. And I remember that one of the first, one of my first memories is from my crib in our first house, where I remember we lived there till I was five. But in my crib, I remember this cutout, wooden cutout of little Bo Peep with her sheep. And there were, I believe there were two little wooden sheep connected with little rope leashes. And that was the art over my crib. And honestly, I think that has a formative, deep in my brain, positive thing that I look at them and go, oh. It's like comforting and, and a little nostalgia, this nostalgic, I mean, yeah. Yeah. And, and people relate to them differently, but sheep are part of our nursery. They're part of our, our culture and part of our babyhood and growing up. Mm -hmm. And I just happen to paint them. Mm -hmm. So it's neat when someone looks at them and says, I want your sheep. And it's happened to two paintings that are in the Ford Point show. Yeah. Lucky me. <laughs> it's so exciting. It's Two of the golden fleece, the two of the gray ones. Yeah. So that's pretty neat. Yeah. Well, it, I'm, sorry, I'm just like, it's, it sounds like you had such an enriching life and it, it's just so exciting to learn more about you. Well, well, thank you, Kim. Thank you for this opportunity. And thank you to Fort Point for uh, spotting circle art and thank you for reaching out beyond the, the Boston area to suburbs, that, that's how we found you. Um, and it, for us in Circle Art and us as individual artists, because we're all individual artists, very, very different. Um, we just think Fort Point is the bomb and we just wish you all the success and all that you do for us. Oh. Thank you. Like, we are a group of artists, and now we've accepted you into our, our community. So your successes, we celebrate, and we're just so excited to, like, have you a part of our team and, like, part of our community. Um, and the opportunities that you've created for us, yeah. the whole artistic community in Boston, we, we all appreciate what you do. Don't ever think anything else because it takes a lot to herd us cats, us artists, and get us, get us going in the right direction. And you give us these markers, like shows at the Atlantic Wharf and virtual open studios um, and artist talks and panel talks. So thank you. Yeah, of course, we do what we can um, during these times. And I'm just really happy that we had this opportunity to like continue with the live show. It's so amazing. Um, yeah, we feel very fortunate. And thank you for asking us. 
and, um, and for seeing us. We appreciate being seen. Thank you. Well, um, I wanna thank you again for taking the time to like talk with me and just kind of sharing your story with um, FPAC. Uh, so once again, we have the show That Which Was Will Come Again. That is at the Atlantic Wharf Gallery, or sorry, the gallery at Atlantic Wharf. <laughs> they have a different name. Yes. 290 Congress in Boston, Massachusetts, and the show will be up until February 20, uh, 2021. Yes, thank you. And I guess I would be remiss if I didn't say, look at my website at carolynletvin.com and my Instagram site at Letvin Carolyn. So thank you again. Thank you.